Hello and welcome to another episode of the Ohio Huntsman Podcast. On this week's show, we kind of summed up a couple news stories, hunting news stories, and we're just going to kind of talk about what's been in the news recently and just kind of have a roundtable discussion about it. But before we get into that, I want to thank our partners. Monster Whitetail Grub is a sponsor of this show, and we really appreciate them sponsoring the show. They have a super awesome deer feed product. It's not just a bag of corn. It's got it's a high protein feed. It's got mineral mixed in. It's got an attractant, so it's like a long range attractant with feed, protein, mineral. It's a great way to get your deer through the rest of the winter cuz now is, you know, we're starting to get a break in the weather, but it's still a, a tough time for the deer and it's a great way to get them through the winter and then attract them when it comes deer season time. So get yourself some monster whitetail grub. Again, we, we appreciate them supporting the show. So support them. They support us. Everybody wins. So you can find them at, at monster whitetail grub on Facebook and Instagram. And before we get into the topic, then the next thing we want to talk about is any updates from the field. And I know Jake, you were out and about today trying to scoop some antlers and stuff, right? Doing some, some after season scouting. That is correct. I spent a better part of the afternoon out in the woods. Unfortunately, I did not come across any white gold. A <sighs> uh, little early, I think, in the areas that I'm able to shed hunt. Um, you running some... any cameras out there? Do you know, or are you just no going, I'm going in blind? Okay. Yeah, going in blind. I just had a ground blind that was still out at the horse farm that I got permission on this year to hunt. Um, so I wanted to get it down, probably should have got it down a while ago. I haven't hunted out there in a long time. Um, so I just want to take it down so that it's not sitting out, you know, it's not a top of the line ground blind by any means. So the weather does a number on them, choose it up pretty quick. So I wanted to get it down and packed away so that it can maybe make it through another season. Um, so that's, that was all good. I, no one had stolen it. So that's good. It was still there. (laughs) That's always uh, nice when your stuff's yeah. still there when you go right. to get it. <laughs> right. It's still there, still standing, which I was quite impressed by. So it didn't blow away in the wind, which it's some of the high winds and stuff. So that was good. I must have fastened it down good. Yeah. Because, I've man, I've seen weather shred some yeah. of those pop-up blinds. So, yeah, it was all good. Um, but uh, walked around, did some scouting, um, found wasn't a total waste. I mean, I found out where the deer aren't based on sign. Um, so I can at least kind of know where the deer are and aren't late season. So you're thinking um, that's late season information. Yeah, I'm thinking that's more late season because I had kind of hunted this property a couple times early season. And then, you know, the rut kicked in and then I was going to my bread and butter spots to try and, you know, we did our rut trip down right. the cabin and I only get so many days in the woods. So I didn't get out to the horse farm. I would say probably at all after the first month of season or so I would say. Um, so I know where the deer, when I was out there hunting at early season, I know where there was sign. So I'm going to go back there early season next year and hope to put the dots together. And if not, I know that the deer aren't in those spots late season because there is no sign, new sign. Um, you have to take some monster white tail grub out yeah, there. Yeah. I think, I think it would actually do a lot of good out there. Um, a lot of the property I have out there, like I said, it's primarily a horse farm, but then there's some wood wooded area that the owner of the farm has. Um, and it's pretty well timbered in the sense that there's not a lot of undergrowth. Um, it's kind of pretty so barren like, wasteland when it comes to like deer. mature trees or? i would say mature trees and then there's a like there's nothing growing underneath it's not very thick um and a big portion of it and then there's a so it's like closed canopy closed canopy yeah like okay. it looks like it has but then there's a lot of down like trees um it's the weirdest thing i don't know i don't know what causes it i'm not a tree expert but you cannot walk through these woods quietly. I mean, it is like twigs everywhere. Yeah. But there's no brush 
hardly on the low, you know. So I think and there's sound because none of Jeff and I haven't been to this property, but it sounds like like Jeff was saying closed canopy, and so the trees are self pruning the lower limbs because they're not getting any sun, and those things are falling to the ground. Yeah, I mean, would it, you, Jeff? Yeah, would, yeah, yeah. It sounds like a mature closed canopy forest. Yeah, and a lot of it is that because um, even if the trees aren't huge like you see in the park or whatever they're you know 100 year old trees it could still be closed canopy right. to where there's no sun getting to the floor so um that portion doesn't hold deer obviously i mean they're crossing through there's plenty of tracks and you know sign but they're not um holding deer and the other weird thing about this property is i never bump deer or jump deer on this property really yeah I've never, I've jumped deer one time on this property. You've gotten pictures of them out there. Oh yeah, they're there. Never... There's deer there. There's pictures of them. The signs, I mean, there's big bucks out there. There's big old scrape, rubs. I mean, there's activity. Yeah. Um, and I've got daylight activity, but I don't, um, I, don't, I just, when you're walking through, and I don't know if that's because it's close canopy that they can see you and they're gone way before you get there. Yeah, it could um, be. You know, I mean, they're not bedding down in that thick, brushy stuff, and you can't jump them like rabbits because they're not holding tight. They're moving way out ahead of you. Um, but I've never, I jumped a buck last year when I was bow hunting on my way out. Um, and it was just a small buck. I, But that's the only deer I've ever pushed, and that was on a separate part of this farm where it is a little thicker. Um, so I did some scouting, figured out, kind of where the deer are and aren't, so hopefully I can put that together. Yeah, it sounds like you might, like your brain tells you to go to this, this wood lot, but there might, maybe there's some kind of fringe spots that you wouldn't normally think of initially that you might right. check out. Yeah. So, and it's it's one of those things that you get, you know, you get access. It's a pretty good-sized chunk of hunting area, um, which I have access to, and as far as I know, I'm, the only person who hunts it but it's just getting time to really dig into it and figure out you know the rest the other places that i hunt i've been hunting there primarily my whole life so i know the ins and outs for the most part i know right. where the deer are so when it comes down to the best day to go hunting the horse farm doesn't make the cut yeah i go where i know the deer are you know so we'll see i plan on trying to run some more cameras out there this year um, just to, now that I know, I was worried last year because it was new to me. I didn't know kind of what the other foot traffic on the property was. So now that I've granted, like I said, this blind is not a top dollar blind, but it would have been very easy for someone to take. Right. And it sat there all season and no one touched it. Um, so I'd be more confident to run some cameras and that kind of stuff and not worry about them getting legs and walking off the property. So, um, hopefully I can run some more cameras out there and figure out a little bit of a pattern more of what's going on and hopefully can get something out there. So and then I also stopped out um, at the other farm out on the east side of the state, tried to drive the fields um, too wet. I couldn't mm -hmm. really get out in the gator and drive the fields. And they, um, I, I knew this, I guess, I just didn't put two and two together. They planted a lot of corn versus beans this year. And the combine they used to pick the corn, I don't know if it was a different one or if they, because it was so wet, it just didn't do a good job. I don't know. But the corn stalks are twice as high as they normally are. Oh. So it's basically impossible. You'd have to walk it on foot. You can't drive through it and pick out shed antlers with, you know, I mean, there's just so much corn stalk, which look just like shed antlers when it's, you know, it's right. just not. So I uh, was out there and nothing there. Like I said, it was too wet to really drive the fields much. Did you get into the woods at all? Did you see any kind of uh, postseason sign? Out at the farm on the east side of the state, I walked very little um, where I thought the big buck that I had on camera out there kind of lived, so to speak, um, just to see, you know, hey – because I was kind of staying out of his bedroom, so to speak. So I walked around to see if I could see, you know, like where is he bedding? Is it in here? Is there beds in here? Um, I found some beds. I don't know that they were necessarily buck beds. 
Um, but I did find some spots down in where I where we thought the deer were bedding down there that are definitely deer bedding, um, which isn't surprising. I mean, we know deer bed in there. It's just I was hoping that I could get some sign that it was him or his bed, you know, like whether that was rubs or whatever, but I just didn't see anything that said, like, this is definitely a buck that hangs out here. Right. Um, so I don't know. I put um, a camera back out there um, just to see if I can get some pictures to see if the deer are still holding their antlers primarily just to get an idea, you know, like, are we wasting time or is it time to get out there? So. Did you get your cell camera out yet? I did. I put it out today. No, oh, okay. Yeah, I put it out there. Um, cool. I haven't checked to see if it's taking pictures. I mean, I don't expect it to during the day where I put it. It's primarily probably going to get nighttime pictures. Um, it's on like a, or a couple different paths, mode type paths kind of come together. Um, so yeah, I got it out today and it took, it sent a picture when I put it up. So it's in good enough cell service because that was my issue out yeah. there originally is the cell service was kind of spotty, but the app said I had two out of five bars. So that's good enough to send pictures because I got one when I was setting it up. So, um, the Good other deal. thing I saw, I forgot about this out at the horse farm, Jeff, you'll find interesting. This, the okay. only interesting thing I came across is we may have another spot for the squirrel grand slam. Oh, saw a black squirrel. Saw a black squirrel. Oh. I could have killed it with a rock. That's exciting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He just, I tried to get a video of him on my phone, but it's, you know how the, when you're just walking through the woods, the squirrel just stands there on the tree looking at you. Yeah. And as soon as you start looking at Paying it, it attention. knows. Yeah. So it scurried into its hole pretty quick. But uh, yeah, I know where a black squirrel lives. So I don't necessarily have permission to hunt squirrels on this horse farm. I only have bow hunting permission, but I could probably get, I would imagine, permission yeah. to hunt squirrels. So and. I mean, even if you can't hunt them with a gun, you might just have to go out there and might, bow hunt. I might have to bow, bow hunt, hunt a squirrel. Bow hunt a black squirrel. Yeah, and get one of those small game points. Right. So, yeah. So, yeah, I saw a black squirrel. That's the only highlight, really, of my... I didn't see any deer. I saw a couple other squirrels, but a black squirrel. Cool. Jeff, you have any updates? Yeah, I have one update. Um, there's an area not too far from one of my hunting spots where, in the past... Oh, maybe 10 years ago, they... Uh, is this hang? Is this your news story, or is this just a, a story that you're telling us? This is just a story. I'm okay, telling. all right. I just want to make sure yeah. I know where I'm at in the process. Yeah, yeah. Good uh, deal. So, uh, not far from one of my hunting spots, they had rearranged how the highway is laid out, interchanges, and they created a an island of woods in the middle of the highway. You know, like, there's an island. Right. You know, there's no way to get to this area without crossing the highway. And uh, I was driving we, past... We're talking major highway? We're talking just like a two-lane... We're talking major highway. Interstate highway. Yeah, yeah. Okay. We're, we're right. talking three just, lanes each way, you know, okay. six lanes. I'm just trying to picture... I'm painting the picture in my head. Okay. Yeah. Rural, rural, I mean, somewhat rural, suburban, right, you know, gotcha. uh, Ohio. Um, but I look down in there and I see what I thought were antlers, you know, and then like the guardrail kind of comes where you can't see. And I was a passenger. Um, and then I, once we kind of get past, I look back and there's two giant bucks standing in there. Really? Yeah. Huge bucks. And uh, it was the February 21st. So, so they still had their headgear on. Yeah, they still had headgear. Okay. Um, and yeah, just giant bucks living in there. And it's like, first off, how did they get in there? Yeah, without you know, getting hit. Right. And, you know, kind of second, it's like, wow, they found a good spot, you know, to, <laughs> right. you know, if they can find food there, then they're or just set. hang out there during the day and come out, you yeah, know, yeah. cross the highway at night. Yeah. It's like, I couldn't believe it, you know, because 
Yeah, I mean, they had two the, of them in there, huh? Two, two wow. standing right next to each other, just hanging out at four thirty. Wow! In the afternoon, just living the dream. Just you know? living the dream, yeah. And it's you know they they smart deer because however yeah. they found a way to get in there, yeah. You know, they, there's no human scent in there. I'm sure. Right. Yeah. You know. They they know they're safe. They're amazing critters, that's for sure. All right. Well, that's sort of because I was thinking about is this kind of local to where we live? Yeah. So I was thinking about possibly going out looking for sheds this weekend. But if you're telling me you saw deer on the 21st, two bucks that still had their antlers, I might wait another week or two. Yeah. Uh, also. In the past week, I saw a smaller buck with both both antlers. Okay. So I I haven't I haven't I mean obviously it's hard when you're driving down the road to yeah, spot yeah. a shed buck versus a doe, yeah. but I've definitely spotted some bucks still still holding. I see you know because this time of year right they get all bunched up you know and so there's this one field I drive by on my way home from work and the other day there was like. 20 deer in this field, you know, and I'm rubbernecking, trying not to wreck my car. Like, right. oh my gosh, look at all the deer in that field, you know? It's yeah. like... <laughs> I used to have a field like that, you know, on my way to and from work, always deer in it. Yeah. This year, something must have changed uh, because never see them. I mean, it, it used to be basically year round, you could see deer there, you know, every other day and in the winter like this you'd see you know 10 15 yeah. deer i've somebody started flinging sharp sticks at them yeah yeah something something's definitely changed so hmm all right well should we get into our our news topics for the day yeah all right well we've got i think we've got two news articles we're going to start with or we're going to talk about today so jeff do you want to start with yours yeah, my uh, the article I found that I found kind of interesting. Um, there's a little bit of a backstory here. Um, a female hunter from Vermont uh, went on vacation to the San Francisco area. She, uh, her friend, was asking about you know online dating apps, and you know like you know you really do that, like you really use them. So she showed her friend, you know, an online dating app, showed her Tinder, you know, so she opened up her profile, you know, in uh, San Francisco. It was it was Tinder specifically we're talking about here. Yes, it was Tinder specifically. Okay. Tinder was the app. Okay. Again, um, I'm just I'm just painting the picture. Yeah. Okay. So she opened up her profile, show her friend. Didn't think anything about it. Um, so a girl from Vermont is in California. Mm-hmm. And whips out her Tinder app yeah. to show her friend. Okay. Yeah. Female I'm with hunter. You. I'm with Female you. Female hunter. Got it. So didn't think much about it. A few hours later in the day, she gets a notification from Tinder that her profile's been shut off, permanently disabled. And, you know, it says for violating their terms of service. Okay. So she reaches out to him and basically says, I didn't do anything. Like, I don't know what you're talking about. And they said that you, they showed her, they, they said like these two photos violate our terms of service. Um, they were, uh, what was the word that they used? Oh, they were, the, the, the photos were upsetting or, Disturbing. Disturbing. Or, okay. I believe, yeah, you can't, yeah, they were disturbing. Had disturbing content or unsettling content. Okay. Um, what these two photos were, were photos of her with deer she had harvested. Oh. Um, and she knew that Tinder had rules about having blood and firearms. And they, they had kind of redone their rules where, which the firearms one is very silly to me um, because basically unless you 
have a gun to kill people, if you have a gun that, that is to kill people, its purpose is to kill people, it's perfectly allowed. If you are in the military or a police officer, like in uniform, you're allowed to have a gun in your photos. If you have a gun because you want to shoot paper, not allowed. Shoot paper or animals, that's not allowed. Really? Yeah. So it's like, that's, I find just really silly. Yeah. But she knew that these were the rules. So she had no guns and no blood in these photos, at least not gory. The one photo, there was a little bit, you could see a little bit of blood. Okay. Um, But they said, these are the two photos that are disturbing. Well, what kind of makes this even more interesting was that she had had these photos on her profile for over a year in Vermont and with no problems. But because she was in the San Francisco area, people had a problem with it and reported them. Oh. And they, you know, banned her for life. Um, and another kind of, to, to take this one step further, was she's she works in marketing. So she knows how to make a tasteful photo. Right, you know, yeah. It's, and not only did uh, Tinder, you know, ban her for life, but also one of the people who found her profile pictures on Tinder found out her real name and contacted her employer trying to get her fired. Really? Yes. People are crazy, man. On, on, on what grounds? What Trying to get her fired for what? Being a hunter? Yeah, basically saying that it doesn't create a good image for their company to have you, someone that thinks that... You do know, you know what company she worked for? I, I don't. But they, did, did it say if they fired her? Did she? I don't. I don't believe so because she found out because her company told her, like, "Hey, just we, so you know, we got this report, like, you know, saying that you." And I don't wow. know. I don't know if they showed the photos to like sent the photos with it. That the the, per, the person may have just said like, "Hey, your employee has some distasteful stuff," and it reflects poorly on your company okay you know and then she had to be like whoa 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 they're just photos of you know yeah big giant box well and that's the other thing was no these were not photos of big giant bucks she she lives in uh burling south burlington vermont which i've been there before um and there's a very strong hunting culture in the area um but it's unique because it's not really a, it's definitely not a big giant buck culture. It's very family oriented. It's, okay. And it's not so much about harvesting. You know, it's very family, you know, when. Being outside with your family and yeah, just enjoying when, when the outdoors. Yeah, comes in. Yeah. Um, Vermont, if you have ever looked at statistics, has some of the lowest success rates for hunters. Um you know, it's something like 19, 20% of people who purchase a tag actually harvest a deer. Okay. Um, so it's a definitely a more of a uh, community family thing. Sure. You know, and any deer, because the success, success rates are so low, any deer is kind of a trophy, you know, something yeah. to be proud of. Yeah. Um, so she and hunting is important to her so i don't know why it would be a problem to basically say you know just straight up front like i'm a hunter this is important to me yeah but it kind of shows how crazy and how hunters are under attack kind of yeah that just something as simple as showing yourself in your harvest is not only gets you banned from a site but also gets people contacting your employer to say hey you should fire this person so <clears throat> just i guess for context i'm not a never used tinder before we're all married folk here i don't know if anybody knows the answer to this but tinder you set up a 
profile and you have a, a couple pictures in there or yeah, how does yeah. it work? I, the general idea of Tinder is you set up a profile. I think it has a short couple of sentences about you, a couple of pictures, and then it's basically swipe left, swipe left or right, whether you're attracted to this person or not. Do you have any buck pictures in your profile? Well, I don't have Tinder. Oh, okay. <laughs> but <laughs> that's what you should say. Your wife listens to the podcast. <laughs> yeah. But I, you know, this was Tinder. I mean, when I was in college, Tinder was starting to come around. Right. So, okay. so I, you once I had a Tinder. No, I've never had a Tinder. But I have definitely known people that have had Tinders. Um, but And then they match you to other people who find you attractive. Then you hook up. Then you, I mean, I think the idea is, yeah, you, you date. You send a message or something. Right. You send a message, start talking. Okay. Maybe go on a date. All right. I got to keep up to date on these things, you know. But definitely new to me. I didn't, Dating apps were not around while I was dating. I always tell my wife, I, I'm glad I don't have to date because I would suck at it these days. <laughs> None of the tactics that I used are what kids use these days. So, Well, the other, okay, so, man, it's it also amazes me how different things can be when you go from one, I don't want to, I don't want to say one side of the country to the other, even though in this case that's what it is, but just from one community to another, right? Like right. we're all people with the same basic needs but just how things i don't know diverge so yeah. differently and another thing i kind of found interesting about this story was that she went from one primarily left-leaning state to a another primarily left-leaning state but the culture was so different yeah. that something that she was doing in her own state that you know, leans the same way on the political spectrum, you know, and seen as perfectly normal there. Right. Is seen as so wrong and is violating people just by seeing it in another place that leans the same way on the political spectrum. So just how variant people are, even when they, you know, are of the same group. If you yeah. Know. Yeah. Hmm. Jake, any other comments on that? I don't even know how to respond to it. It's so ridiculous. <laughs> I don't even have like I can't even formulate a thought. Like I just it's just the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. Um It's pretty yeah, out there. I don't know. I just it's so off the wall to me to think that a picture of a female hunter and her harvest would be appalling to someone or disturbing. I don't I don't know, especially if it was a tasteful, cleaned up picture. Right. It's not like she, yeah, showed a picture of a you know a deer that was headshot, you know, like and was disfigured so, or like I don't know. It's just crazy. To so me. here's one for you guys: Do you think the situation would have played out differently if it was a man? See, and this was something that the article went into. Did it? Um, some of the articles went into, they actually went to that area and went through Tinder profiles of men and found multiple, you know, similar photos. Yeah. And they, you know, were still there. They were up. Uh, I think they even went as far as to contact some of these people and say, hey, you know, we're doing a news story. How long have you had this photo up here? And, you know, a lot of them said years, you know, so that goes into, yeah, was it gender biased on Tinder's part or was it gender biased that guys found it more appalling, you know, that, that it was a female yeah. than women found it appalling, you know, cause I would imagine that Tinder does not have the ability to scan every picture uploaded to tinder they right. rely on people reporting that content to them right and in this case i mean 
for something set people off and rep- that she got reported enough that within a couple of hours she was shut down. So, I mean, there was now it could be that the frequency of men on, you know, the app is higher than females right. and that's why, or it could be that, you know, men who are supposed to be, you know, so, so called the tougher gender were, are more offended by that than women are, you know, because it's, they're, they're, they're not only offended because it's a, a harvested animal, but they're also offended because a woman harvested, you know, they're, they're just offended that a woman could do that. Right. You know, so I, I think there, there is a gender bias a little bit of, you know, non hunters find hunting women even more repulsive, you know, because it's not, not only is it, that they're killing an animal, but you're, you're a woman. You're supposed to, to, to know better kind of thing, you know? And I, it's just crazy, man. Yeah. It's scary. Cause you know, I've got a daughter and I hopefully she'll hunt when she gets older. And it's just a, it's kind of a wild time that we're in. I think society, y- you know, you forget that like the internet and social media is still, really in its infancy like we as a population are still trying to figure out how to do life with all of these things and I don't know I hope it I hope it sort of sorts itself out and it comes back down to a level ground yeah. but I, it's it's definitely changed society right I mean the, the advent of the internet and social media has changed the way we interact as a society, the way we communicate, and you get a you get a lot of good things from social media, right? I mean, we've got a following on on social media, and we're interacting and talking to people that we've never met in, in real life and mm-hmm. having engaging conversations with them, and that's all good. But you also get this sort of hate and just nastiness that comes with it that right. definitely in the hunting community seems to be targeted at women, right? You, any of these these women that take pictures with an African animal, right? It's a it's a news frenzy. It's a headline. It's a right where guys have been taking those pictures for years, right? It, and it's no big deal. Any of these female hunters, if you look at their profiles and their Instagram pictures or anything, and you look through the comments you can almost guarantee that there's a guy on there leaving some kind of nasty comment. Well, yeah, and also they, they get, a, at a much higher frequency, they get, you know, the the sexist stuff, you know, the, the I don't know what the word I'm looking for is, but the vulgarity in that way. Yeah. But they also, at a much higher frequency, get the the hate of how can you kill this beautiful animal type, right. you know, yep. And you're you're a disgusting monster for, you know, yeah, t- for wanting to kill and cause pain, and which, you know, hunters obviously, uh, pain is never the goal, right? You know, it's so they they get a lot more of that hate as well, which is sad, yeah, because, I mean, women have just as much right to the woods as anyone else, and <laughs> it they they're historically underrepresented in, in the sport. Right. Yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know. I wish I knew the psychology behind that. Like why, what is it about that? That just seems to set some people off. Right. Like, Mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe, you know, it's this image that women or, or, you know, females are supposed to bring life into the world. And, and I don't know. We're getting pretty deep here, but it's just, it's things that I think about now that I have a daughter, right? I mean, Jake, you've got a daughter. It's, these are things, they're still young, but these are things that we as dads are going to deal with and have to navigate as parents to a daughter. We never had sisters, right? We never, we're, we're all brothers, right? We had three, grew up three brothers, we never dealt with 
somebody being nasty to our sister and, and saw that. And so now we've got daughters and how do you navigate that? And especially now that we're in this age of social media where, you know, you got keyboard warriors that can just be nasty. I don't know. But also another kind of thing is there, there really just seems to be a lot of a lack of positive female role models in the hunting community. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of the sexy, you know, stuff, but not just women that want to be out there hunting, you know, on, right, on yeah. social media, on, you know, it, if you look at, even if you see the rare occasion where a woman is in advertising, you know, for hunting stuff, you know, there's always this sex factor to it. Right. And it, it's, it's almost like it's designed to appeal to men more than women. You yeah. know, the, the actual women who are purchasing those clothes, it's not designed to appeal to them. It's designed to appeal, appeal to the men to buy that stuff for their, you know, their, the female yeah. in their life. Hey, honey, I got you this. Right. Sort of right. thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think that's a, I mean, that's media across the board. Though. I mean, women are objectified in advertising. That's a known thing. That's across. Yeah. The, yeah. You got a point there. You know yeah. I mean, that's just, it's been that way forever. And that's something that I hope changes. I mean, it seems to be taking baby steps that way with, you know, a lot of big corporations going to, you know, not airbrushing their ass. Right. And, yeah. Yeah. You know, no makeup on or whatever it is, you know, unaltered photos mm -hmm. and, yeah, you are um, seeing more of that. So you start getting a little bit more of that, which I think is good. You know, it's a realistic, semi-realistic. I mean, these women are still obviously spending hours in hair and makeup to get the look that they have. But yeah. um, at least they're not airbrushing them down to Barbie figures. Um, but I, I would agree with you, Jeff. I mean, I not that there's not positive role models for females in the hunting industry, but because the hunting and outdoors industry is primarily male, the ones that gain traction are the quote unquote sexy ones, because that's what the men, you know, like if you look at Instagram, that's the ones that have a hundred thousand, yeah. hundred thousand followers, they're your quote unquote sexy female hunters, which there's nothing wrong with a female who likes, enjoys hunting and also happens to be very attractive. That's not, argument of making at all i mean you could be sexy and hunt that's all cool um but you know i do get i also can see there's a big barrier to entry i would say for females who are just your average mom wife you know office worker who yeah. you know it's there's no place for me because i don't look like that when i wear you know, camo or when I go hunting, that's not what I look like. I look like the marshmallow man. I'm all layered up and puffy and, um, you know, it's, yeah, there's kind of something that's inherently not sexy, you know, about the proper attire to hunt. Yeah. You know, so it's when it's made to be sexy, I don't know, to me, it just seems more violating, you know, as a, as a, as a hunter, I feel, and I'm not even a female, so I'm sure a female hunter feels very violated by it, you know, like. Well, it's entirely non-practical. I mean, the way right. that they make up these advertisers, you know, and I mean, even the men, though, if you look, you know, it's not practical hunting, you know, like you'll have an ad of a guy who's like carrying his bow and creeping, you know, walking through a raging stream and it's like. You're now soaked and freezing. Like yeah. that's not real. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, it's that's just advertising. You know, you make it. They have to try to sell and make it look to whatever image they're going for. But, um, you know, I don't know. I can agree, though. I mean, there is a barrier for women. I mean, my wife doesn't hunt. She supports hunting. She doesn't hunt. So I don't know specifically of you know like the apparel and for women and that kind of stuff. My wife doesn't buy that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, but I do see, you know, through social media and through, you know, the, 
I don't really watch very many hunting TV shows, um, but you know the occasional YouTube video. Um, you know, for the most part, it is the just like any other media, sex sells. I mean, it's yep. pretty much your stereotypical, quote unquote, attractive woman, mm-hmm. which funny in its own right to say because most i mean everyone finds different things attractive about the other the opposite sex so yeah. it's but it's typically you're you know thin tall blonde you know wearing tight fitting clothes or you know having your bust hanging out right. or whatever yeah you know, almost always is, large chested right yeah and yeah my wife does hunt she's a new hunter you know late onset hunter and I can tell you, she definitely feels discouraged by a lot of the barriers to, you know, female hunting, you know, because especially in the stuff, you know, hunting implements, clothes, whatever specifically designed for women, you know, that there isn't a lot of it or what there is, is just the men's stuff. It's not actually tapered to a woman's body. It's just the men's stuff with a pink label. Yeah. You know, and then when she sees these ads and stuff, it's like, well, that's not the way I look either. So clearly that clothes, you know, that's not for me. Yeah. You know, um, so I have a, do you guys want to go down a rabbit hole? Cause I have another topic that just popped in my head here. Let's we're go already, for it. We're already yeah. in a rabbit hole. Yeah. So let's some, just yeah. continue through the tunnel. Yeah. Let's keep chasing this rabbit. <laughs> um, so my wife has female friends that hunt and, you know, hunting families. And one of them told her a story. Hang um, on, side note. How how many friends are we talking here? Because as we're talking here, I'm thinking it might be, it'd be good to have, like, your wife on and some other female hunters to talk, like, to get their side of this story. Would it be they, a, a They group? would love to do that. I mean, well, Maybe she, we'll have to make that happen. She has... Two, three. That's perfect. Yeah, we don't yeah, need twenty. Yeah. We just right, need a, right. Yeah, we don't have she, that many mics. She, yeah. she definitely has a couple that would, I'm sure, love to do that. Okay. Um, Go on. But hunting family. She uh, brought a venison dish to a potluck. This friend. This I, friend. I believe it was chili. She brought venison chili to a potluck. To like a work event or just a. Uh, I'm not sure. It was, it was some sort of a potluck where yeah. there's people other than your family. Yeah, it was not a this. family. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. But uh, she brought venison chili and did not inform, you know, didn't write anywhere that this is venison chili. It's it's chili. Right. Um, and one woman took great offense to this. Like she ate it and basically claimed that, you know, she got ill, took took a lot of offense to it. Found out after the fact that it was venison. Yeah. And okay. you know and you know, kinda Amber came home and said, like, you know, do you notify people? And it's like, well, you know, I don't really make a point to do it, I don't think, but it's kinda one of those things like, do you feel that you have like a duty to notify? Like, do you feel that you have to tell people like, "Hey, this is, this is wild game. This is a rabbit hole." <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, this could go a long way, but um, I just think it's understood that anyone who knows me knows that any dish prepared with ground meat has ground venison in it. Like for my son's first birthday party, we served chili, and it was ground venison, and I did not notify anyone of that. Mm-hmm. If you don't know that, that's your problem. You're not that good of a friend. Yeah. I mean, in my mind, you know now what I do mean? You, like it's known. Now, do you take what we dishes use. into work? Like, do do people at work know that you hunt? Yeah, and... yeah. People, but I don't take dishes into work. Yeah. Um, I mean, we don't. Where I work, it's not really a. We don't do. Can't really have food back yeah, there. Yeah, can't kind really of thing. have food. We can't really. You know, it's not big enough. Like my wife has. You know, she is a nurse, and she has. There's for holidays, like whatever they break bring room, food in. Yeah. Does um, she does she take food? Does she take wild game food? Because she wouldn't be opposed to it. I don't know that yeah. she ever has. Yeah. I mean, my wife does most of the cooking in our house, if not all of it. I mean, I cook very select few things, um, and she cooks. So she cooks with venison all the time. Yeah. 
Um, a lot of her dishes include venison. Like I said, any ground meat that comes out of the kitchen in my house is 99% of the time ground venison. Um, so I don't know that she's taken a dish in specifically, um, but she would, and I don't know that she would announce it to everyone that that's what yeah. it was. I don't think, yeah, because I don't think of, you have a duty to, I mean, I guess unless there's, I don't know of an allergy to venison. I don't think you can be allergic to venison. Maybe you can. Someone I, I'm sure uh, will tell yeah. us that you can be. Yeah. Um, but other than like from an allergy perspective, that's the only reason I would think that you should have to notify anyone of what yeah. is in your dish. I, I don't know. I don't know. I, where yeah. I'm at, I, I don't, I don't think you should have to, but as I'm thinking back, I think I typically do just because I know I've worked in enough, I'll call them, you know, businesses that are in bigger cities to where, you know, even though we're in Ohio, like, they don't know anybody that hunts sort of thing. And so I'm the odd guy out, not the norm. And so as I'm thinking back, I think I do typically notify people because I've even got people in my family that know I hunt and now they know and, and they, you know, they choose not to eat venison. Not that they get like super grossed out if they ate it and they find out later, but they typically now will ask, is this made from venison? And if yes, then they mm. choose to pass on that dish. But I think for work type things, I think I do typically notify people that it's venison. Yeah. So Amber does bring, take, you know, wild game stuff to, to her work. And because of this story, she definitely makes a point to notify people. Um, but also on the same vein, I was kind of thinking like, think back when we were kids, you know, we, we only basically ate venison. We'd have friends over and we never told them that like, no, this yeah. is venison. So I'm just thinking like, how many people have we kind of like duped, if you will, <laughs> you know, like, and I, I could see in today's day and age, you know, you guys have one of your kids friends over and you feed the kid venison and the parent getting upset. And if you had a picture of a venison dish on your Tinder profile, there you go. <laughs> yeah, you well, definitely get kicked this off. Kind of real life story. I have a neighbor who is good friends with my wife, uh, and she is not a hunter. I don't want to say she's an anti hunter, but she doesn't, she's someone who chooses not to consume venison dishes. So anytime we have her over for dinner, she normally only eats the salad type thing because she knows there's probably venison. Yeah. In it. Uh, she came over for the Super Bowl and I had venison jerky out uh, that I had from this year's harvest. And I cut it up, you know, into little bite sized pieces. And both of her kids were just smashing it. They were loving it. <laughs> and then it came out that it was venison. Not that I don't know why they would have thought it was anything else. Um, but they. It was kind of one of those things that both kids who are, I don't know their exact ages, but 9 and 12 maybe or somewhere in that ballpark, I don't know. Um, they were like, this is deer meat? And I'm like, yeah, isn't it good? And they're like, uh, yeah, yeah. And then they kept eating it, but their mom was kind of like, you really like that? <laughs> but I don't know. They ate it, and she's eaten at my house, and I've served her venison, and she liked it, but she just on morals can't yeah, like it. It's just thing. a principal thing that yeah, I'm just, weirded out by it. Right, right. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I don't, it's, I guess it <laughs> just goes to one of those things. I mean, I don't know. And anything in life is learned, you know, like if you, you know, like race or whatever, you put two kids, three year olds, you know, are, daughters are three years old three-year-olds in a room they don't know race color ethnicity right that's just someone to play with you know that's all learned and it's i think it's the same thing with any foods really but specifically wild game like it's not weird unless you make it weird right yeah i mean it's definitely you know, it's, a learned thing right like we think it's weird that people are oh i ate deer meat and it made me sick or you know i don't want to eat that because we grew up eating it 
you know, I now as an adult, I try to be more adventurous. I'll try anything once, you know. I went to China and tr- tried some mm-hmm. some weird things, you know. But on the surface, you know, it's like you eat what, and but that's their culture. That's what they do there, right? And so to them, it's not weird. To me, it's weird. And so, uh, you know, I can see how people can be weirded out about it. I, uh, but I, I just wish, in general, right? I wish people would just be a little more open-minded, and if it's what's normal in the culture, or, or you know, it's it's part of that culture, then give it a try. You know? Yeah. I mean, I'm generally pretty open to. I'm like you. I'll try anything once, especially if it's. I'm in a different area or a different culture. You know, if I'm, yeah, I mean, I, you know, if I had a, I don't know, pick something Indian friend, I guess, or whatever. And I went to their house and they prepared dinner. I wouldn't dare be like, I'm not eating that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like that's the normal and I'm here, I'm your guest. So I'm going to try it. I mean, if I don't like it, I'm not going to like choke it down necessarily. Yeah. But you know, like, I don't know. I almost, I don't want to come off too aggressive, but like, I almost find it, borderline insulting that someone is like not willing you know i prepared this meal for you and you're not going to eat it on some principle that is faulty at best yeah (laughs) you know what i mean like what's your real reason that you're not going to eat wild game like what like i said if it makes you sick if you've tasted it got food poisoning or whatever then i get it you've had a bad experience but you just don't eat it because you I don't, for what? I don't know. Why? Yeah. And I, I mean, I think we as hunters can, that's an opportunity when you're engaging with somebody that's not a hunter to make a good impression or make a bad impression. Yeah. Right? You can make fun of them and belittle them and give them a bad taste when it comes, <laughs> no pun intended, bad taste. <laughs> See what I did there? Um, <laughs> but you can give them a bad impression of hunters because of the way you responded to that scenario, right? But if you, I think people would be generally understanding and seem to be, the research shows, right? When you talk about the food and and it's the clean eating and you know where this meat came from and it's not full of antibiotics and hormones and, you know, people can look at that and go, oh, well, maybe I want to give it another try, you know? Right. But... I don't know. It's an opportunity, I guess, in those situations when you're dealing with somebody that's not used to eating wild game. So, now that we've surfaced from that, yeah. do we want to get into this other topic? Because oh, we're already, we're almost an hour in. Do we want to get into this one or do we want to save it? You're the only one that knows what it is. So, yeah, I think you're going to have to make that decision. You wouldn't yeah. tell us what the topic was. As Yeah. All right, let's get into it. Cover it quick, or no? But let's just be a long podcast. Yeah, whatever. Let's get into it. You guys, buckle up. Yeah, you guys. This is your opportunity to take a break. Yeah, you know, you can go get a snack, then come back. Right, take a pee break, something. Come on back. All right. So, in the news, you may have seen or heard on social media, and I think we even had a listener mention this to us in our. Ohio Huntsman Facebook community, which if you're not a member of, you should definitely join the Facebook community. A lot of kind of interesting conversations over there. So, But South Carolina is, there's a senator from South Carolina that has introduced a bill that would pay hunters $75 for each coyote they shoot. Now the article I read said shoot, but I'm assuming you could trap them as well. You just would have to bring this coyote pelt or, or I don't know, a carcass or something in, and you would collect your $75 bounty. They're going to pay for this bounty expense by increasing hunting license costs by $1 per license. And so that's where the they're going to fund the $75 per, um, per coyote. The article said, you know, that South Carolina estimates they have in the order of 350,000 coyotes. And so I guess I wanted to get your guys' thoughts on that. Do you think 
Ohio should introduce a bounty on coyotes? Do you think it would be helpful for starters? And then two, would you, if yes, I guess on that first one, would you be willing to take an increase on hunting license prices to fund that bounty program? Yeah, so this is a really interesting topic. Yeah. Because from, you know, my biology background that I have, coyotes are kind of uh, a point of contention just to begin with. Because some biologists, you know, wildlife managers in Ohio and this area say coyotes are an invasive species. Right. They are not native. They should not be here. You know, kill them all. Right. Um, and then others kind of say, well, they're not really invasive. They have, you know, this was a natural migration. Right. And because the, the, their predators have been killed, they naturally migrated into this area and it's, it's, it is a natural process. So there's, there's some some argument amongst the... Just right at the core of the, of yeah, the issue. Yeah, right at the core here. And kind of on which side of... I mean, because obviously, if you're on the side saying that they're invasive, it's that's kind of the philosophy of kill them all. Right. And we need to, to make great efforts to kill them, you know, to remove them from the landscape. You know, if you're on the other side, it's kind of saying, like, no, they... They fit a, a niche and, you know, they're invi- they're uh, helping the environment and they're, they're part of the food cycle. Right. So I, yeah, I mean this, that goes straight to the core of this of the argument. issue. Yeah. Or any know. issue when it comes to coyotes and deer hunting. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, this is a pretty, from, from the science, you know, area, this is pretty hot you know, a pretty hot button issue Mm -hmm. here. Um, I really think that in Ohio that the prey species have not yet adapted to the presence of coyotes. They had adapted to the absence of them, you know, because there was, well, and the absence of, you know, large predators. They had definitely adapted to not having them. And now there is a large predator back. And at least in the, you know, the micro habitat area where it's, you know, this wood lot versus that wood lot, they are having devastating effects. Um, See, because all the articles I read said that the coyotes in the southeastern part of the United States are having population level impacts. But all the research that they've done in other parts of the country is that they're not. Now, I can see, like, on your 20 acres or whatever, right? if right. you've got a, a coyote den there, you probably ain't going to see many deer. Right. And not so much deer, but, you know, rabbits. You know, they... they if you have a coyote den, you know, you have a 10 acre wood lot and you got a coyote den in it, you know, your rabbits are, you're not going to see as many rabbits as you used to. Right. You know, and then that's kind of stealing food from hawks, but you know, hawks can kind of go to the next wood lot. And, yeah. But it, they're at least in the micro, you know, habitat level, they're, they're having impacts. Right. And yeah, the, the difference between the, the South and the, the research that's been done in the South and the research that's been done in the North and the Northeast, very different, you know, like their results are extremely different, right? Like almost to the point where it's like something's wrong here because there's like, kind of like this hard line too of like, you know, you go one state up and, oh, no, coyotes aren't having any impact. And, you know, yeah. like West Virginia, there's no impact. But Tennessee and Virginia, there's a major impact, you know, and it's like. 
Well, in the states you hear about or a lot are Georgia, South Carolina, that area, right? You you see studies where coyotes are definitely having from a, not just from a hunter observation point of view, but from a people have done scientific research. They've done right. studies where they've got an area where they've taken all the coyotes out and put a fence up and what does the population inside this area do versus the population outside of the fence? You know, they're doing scientific research, not, not right. backyard, you know, hunter observation research. And they are definitely seeing population level impacts caused from coyote predation on fawns. That's primarily where they hurt the population, right? That's what you've right. seen, right? right? The coyotes yes. are, are getting after the fawns in the spring and not enough fawns are making it through those first couple weeks of, of their life where they're susceptible to coyote predation and in order to sustain or grow the population in those areas. Right. right. There's also a little bit of a research bias here um, because people who are familiar with a lot of the research that gets published in uh, basically hunting-related science, a lot of that comes out of the South. That's where a lot of the interest is from an academic standpoint. Um, Georgia, you know, they're very cutting edge in deer research. And, you know, they, so there is kind of a sort of a bias, if you will, because yeah. that's where a lot of the research from a hunting standpoint is coming from mm -hmm. where in the north a lot of the research is coming from more of a i don't want to say academic standpoint but like more yeah academic was the complete wrong word but more of a uh not not focused on on the impacts on hunters you know, it's it's more of a ecosystem okay. focus. Okay, I see what you're saying. Yeah, it's not... In, in the South, a lot of times the research is focused on the hunting economy. You know, that's, right. that's yeah. what they're, they're kind of targeting, is making sure that the hunting economy is going to stay healthy. Where in the, the North, a lot of times, it is more from a from a academic curiosity right i see know? so there there is kind of and that that's goes all the way to the way they kind of structure these the research yeah research yeah so one of the things i read is is you know why why does the south see such bigger impacts from coyotes than the rest of the country right the southeast and one of the things i read is they were sort of speculating that maybe it's a habitat thing in that you have a lot of pine plantations in the southeast and those don't make for great fawning cover and they are very easy for a coyote to cruise those rows of pines. They're sort of set up for a coyote to cruise them, right? And mm -hmm. and just pick off all the, all the fawns they find. And so maybe it's a population thing. And I've heard other wildlife scientists and, and wildlife biologists and things talk about like the best thing you can do because everybody oh, i'm going to shoot the coyotes right but shooting coyotes you know let me preface this with i'm not a, a you know i don't have a background in wildlife biology or anything like that but my my google research All right says that you need to kill 75 percent or more of the coyotes to have an effect on the coyote population. So shooting one or two here and there isn't doing anything during deer season. Right. Everything I've seen, which again, I'm not a wildlife biologist or researcher, is that the only way you can have an impact on a coyote's pop of the coyote population is targeted time frame harvest. Yeah. You have to harvest them when the, and it's not really on the population per se. It's more you want to knock their population back at a critical time for the deer. Right. The so goal, you, right, what I was going to knock see, them back in the spring when the fawns are hitting the ground. Right. Because you've got a local population of coyotes and you've got transient coyotes that are going to move about. Right. And so if you can time your harvest, which is typically most effective with trapping, 
but I guess if you had enough people out there with guns, you could do it with shooting them, I suppose. Mm. But if you knock that local population down and time it such that the transient population doesn't have time to come backfill that vacancy and that buys the fawns time to get through that first couple of weeks where they're vulnerable, that's the best way to help your, you're not even really trying to control the coyote population. You're trying to control them for that month so that your fawns survive past where they're really vulnerable to coyote predation. Right. From a, from the science background here, wildlife management background. Yeah. Coyotes are, uh, I can't forget or can't remember the exact term for it, but they're reactive breeders first off. So if you kill coyotes and create more territory for them, they will breed to fill that space. Yes. Also, right. I've heard they have larger larger litter sizes based on need, so to speak. Yes. I think we've talked about this book, but if you want to read about like cuz coyotes are really a really fascinating animal. If you if you read the book um, Coyote America by Dan Flores, he talks a lot about this stuff in there. Yeah. So it's a good read if you're if you're interested. Yeah. Um, and another thing that killing coyotes does is coyotes are very territorial. So if you have a, a dominant pack or male um, in an area, he controls that area and doesn't allow other coyotes to come in. So you, you have just those coyotes. If you wipe them out, what you get is all these transient coyotes coming in and juveniles trying to create their own, uh, you know, territory. And a lot of times you're going to have a reaction effect, a reactive where your coyote population is actually going to spike and you're going to have a lot more coyotes because the top dog, um, no, pun, know, intended. no, no pun intended, <laughs> but is, is wiped out. Right. And he's not there defending that 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 area yeah i read that too they said that this article put it they the beta males so you have your alpha male right the beta males in a you know a sort of standard population of coyotes may not even breed because the alpha male is doing all of that and the coyotes can tell like one of the things they talk about in this book is if a coyote howls and they don't get responses back from other packs of coyotes or other coyotes they, that triggers bigger litters like we just talked about and so they they this article i was reading talked about that where like the beta males the lower the second tier third tier males may not even be breeding because they're not trying quote unquote trying to grow the population the population is is where it needs to be sort of thing right and they're they're being kept away from the females. And, yeah. So to get back to your original question, do I think this would be effective in Ohio? I just from my knee jerk reaction to it, um, I will. If it ever were to come to fruition or become anything, I think it should be a targeted season. Like not that there should be a season for coyotes. But the bounty should only be in effect in the spring. In the spring, I was thinking the same thing when I was reading about this because the impression I get is that this is a is an all year right. round thing. Right. And what that another impact that's going to have is kind of extend the coyote season. Really, I mean, there is no season, but most serious coyote hunters only hunt in the winter, right? Because they are they're hunting for the pelts, right? And in the spring, they don't have that pelt so um it would effectively kind of extend because really i think the people who are really gonna do the most damage here are the people who are serious coyote hunters right you know the people who have the night vision who have the infrared who have invested a lot of money into coyote hunting yeah um i think those are going to be the people that are going to do the most you know, have the most impact on the coyotes. Yeah. You know, it, it definitely may encourage someone to 
blow their turkey hunt, you know, to, to shoot one. Cause I really recommend doing that. That's about the perfect time, especially because yeah. you, a lot of times that tur- that coyote is responding to your calling. So they're, they're, that's a coyote that wants to eat turkeys. Right. Um, and it's right around the perfect time of the year. So yeah, I, I really recommend, uh, coyote comes by you, uh, take him out of the population. Pepper his face. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, and I, obviously just from the, I guess not even getting into the argument of whether coyotes have a place in the landscape or not, assuming that they do, they're in the landscape, assuming they have a place. Right. I feel like there needs, there would have to be a cap on this bounty so that we don't run into the issue where they're being exterminated. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like they're, whatever the number is, whatever they feel the population can handle, if you have to kill 75% of them, then that cap can be 75% of the coyotes in Ohio, whatever it is, just to where it's once that many bounties are collected, coyotes then become closed so to speak i don't think that would ever happen we'd ever get there um yeah but in case we did assuming we don't want to eliminate the entire population 75 dollars is a pretty big perk i mean i i think you'd get a lot of guys out there i mean trying it would it would at least educate a lot of coyotes that yeah hey that's the other thing though coyotes aren't dumb animals not that deer are but you know coyotes are smart I don't, so, I, I, I mean, honestly, can... and this, uh, this might ruffle some people's feathers, but from the stuff that I've read, I don't think while I would love to get paid $75 to bring in a coyote, that would, that would make me happy. And I would do my best to, to shoot as many as I could. I don't think guys out there with guns are going to hurt the coyote population. It's going to, don't get me wrong. It's going to reduce the population, but I don't think guys with guns are going to wipe the population out or, I mean, because they tried, right? The government funded back in the 40s and 50s, they fund, right? That's what happened to the wolf population. They tried to do the same thing with the coyotes and they couldn't do it, right? They were trying to poison them and they couldn't do it. Like this article I was reading says that coyotes have a fission fusion adaptation. It says it's a rare survival strategy that we human beings also evolved. Uh, in coyote terms, fission, fission fusion enables them to function both as a pack of predators and as singles and pairs. When they're persecuted, they tend to abandon the pack strategy and scatter across the landscape in fission mode, which enables them to colonize widely. And so then it goes on to say, not that I want to sit here and uh, read to you guys, But just give me one second here, because it was another interesting sort of tidbit from this this article I was reading. Okay, so the biological survey created a lab. Yeah, by the 1920s, it had managed to pretty much extirpate wolves in North America, at which point it turned to the coyote, deciding for the 20th century that this was the arc predator of our time. The biological survey created a lab it named the Eradication Methods Laboratory, which began working on various kinds of poisons, strychnine at the outset, to wipe coyotes off the face of the continent. In 1931, Congress passed a bill that gave the agency $10 million over a decade to do exactly that. What ensued was the lab's invention of several new poisons, including 1080, and the most epic taxpayer-funded campaign of persecution against the animal in North American history. In one nine-year period between 1947 and 1956, the Bureau killed approximately 6.5 million coyotes in the American West, using blanket poisoning, sometimes with as many as 3 to 4 million poison baits out at a time. And they didn't kill them all. I mean... So paying hunters seventy five bucks to go out and shoot them, right? You ain't gonna hurt them. You're gonna slow them down, but you got to kill seventy five percent of the population to have a population effect on coyotes. They can, ha- you know, they their typical litters are five to six. When the population gets low, you know, they're having litters of what twelve to fifteen pups. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, it's 
I think, I mean, I don't, I don't know. So, so this could be completely naive of me and uneducated to say, but I'm pretty sure that the same holds true for the wild hog. That's what I was just about to get in. It's actually much higher. Um, it's around 85 to 90 percent. Uh, you have to kill 85 to 90 percent of the population each year to keep a stable population. Yeah. Um, that's why the wild hog problem is such a problem. Right. Is and they are having a like a detrimental <clears throat> landscape effect on everything. Correct. I think another thing I thought when I was researching this is you know people are oh they're seeing coyotes in cities now they're you know they're so overpopulated but you know you could speculate that maybe the reason you're seeing them in cities is because there's easy prey there. Right. That's where they want to be. Really. I mean, because they they. They don't need to chase down food. They can eat your garbage. Right. Yeah. Right. They're scavengers. They eat your garbage. They eat your, you know, the, the neighborhood cats. Um, roadkill. Roadkill. And the other thing is, you know, in these urban, suburban areas where people are, you know, they're losing thousands of dollars of landscaping to deer and they don't want hunting maybe having some coyotes around isn't such a bad deal, right? Because right, in those areas, the deer are the ones that are having a landscape effect where they're, you know, there's a browse line, right? Everything right. below, there's no forest regeneration. There's no new growth. Everything's being eaten. So maybe it's not such a bad thing. Right. And the the prey is even easier because, you know, in a in a development, there's no real cover for a fawn. Right. So a coyote can just walk through and, oh, here's a fawn laying in someone's mowed grass or in their flower bed, their neatly maintained flower bed right next to a bush. Right. Easy to see. I'm going to go eat that. Right. Because there's know. no good fawning cover or if what little fawning cover there is doesn't support the number of deer there are that are having fawns. Right. Right. The, the good fawning cover is taken and the rest are left to find a place. Right. Speaking of coyotes, since we're on the topic, I just found this kind of interesting. Um, I live in a development that is kind of on the edge of, it's so basically a development surrounded by fields. Right. Um, kind of borders on, I don't want to say farm country, but it's. Yeah, I mean, there's some farm goes, fields, some overgrown fields, um, you know, forest things. Like it's not, so it's kind of a development in the middle of, I don't want to say the middle of the woods, but it's not like. Typical suburbia. Right. It's on the outskirts of town, then it sort of transitions into more rural right. kind of landscape. Um, but in the last year, there's been development around my development, which wiped out a lot of good wildlife habitat. Um, but what that has come brought to fruition is there's actually a, according to the Summit County Parks, sustainable Rignac pheasant population by my house. Really? Yes. I saw. I told you guys a while back that I saw ringneck pheasant, and I thought that was just a one one off thing. Maybe because the parks bought um, some land near where I live, or had re reclaimed, or whatever happened to. It. I don't know exactly all the politics of it, but I thought maybe they had let some go in there, and it was just that won't last long because there's also a lot of coyotes by my house in those woods because it's kind of you know same idea a lot of homes garbage small pets you know there's coyotes around my house we hear them see them whatever so i'm like oh coyotes are gonna crush that but they've been showing up more people in my development have been posting pictures on the internet and all kinds of stuff apparently there's at least like a mating pair of ringneck pheasant hmm. so this gets that are like Brings this full circle because the article I thought you were actually going to do was an art. There was an article just released by I can't remember which organization it was. Pheasants Forever, I think, uh, saying that coyotes are good for pheasants oh. um, because coyotes eat nest predators. Coyotes oh. don't really bother. They they have a hard time catching pheasants and they don't really bother the nests. Oh, okay. That yeah. makes sense then, because I was thinking, like, coyotes would wipe them out. Right. Pheasants have trouble just on their own. Yeah. But apparently coyotes don't like or yeah. don't have a problem with pheasants. Right. So, yeah. They, they have a hard time catching them, and 
they eat the nest predator. So it, there was an article just released hmm. saying that coyotes are good for pheasant. Hmm. It's interesting. Because, yeah, that I, is interesting. that's kind of what yeah. I was going with it is I'm surprised that there was pheasant because yeah. I would say around my house I have a higher coyote population than most suburban or areas. I mean, there's a pretty good, when I put a trail camera out around my house, if it's out for a week, I'm guaranteed to have pictures of coyote on it. Hmm. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. I hadn't I hadn't seen that article. Yeah, I I was sure that was the article you were going with. Yeah, I don't I don't know if we mentioned that at the beginning, but we didn't we picked news articles and we didn't tell each other what the news article was going to be, so that you know we were just kind of reacting on the first or first sort of instinct on the story. So. One other thing I wanted to mention on this, and again, I'm I'm not a wildlife biologist, and I didn't stay at a Holiday Inn or a, is that a Holiday Inn? What's I messed the joke up. Uh-huh. Doesn't yeah, matter. Messed it up. It's a Red Roof Inn. No, it's Holiday. Inn. It's a Holiday Inn. I didn't stay yeah. at a Holiday Inn either. But just because you're getting, you know, you see trail camera pictures of a coyote carrying a fawn leg around or something, you know. <sighs> I was reading again that there's two types of predation, what they call compensatory predation and additive predation. Compensatory is coyotes are eating fawns that would have died anyway. They would have, there's not enough food to sustain them. There's not enough good habitat. Whatever the case, they get hit by a car, right? There's some number, there's some mortality rate on fawns and compensatory predation isn't really adding to the number of fawns that are being killed. That same number of fawns would have died. That mortality rate right. is the same. Then there's additive, which by its name is adding to the mortality rate of the fawns. So I guess I just say that to say there's a lot that goes into this, right? It's not just as easy as kill the coyotes if fawns survive, right? There's some fawns that are still going to die anyway. And just because a coyote ate a fawn, y- you got a picture of it, you know, it, it's not necessarily... It the, might not even be that the coyote killed the fawn. The right, fawn might have right. died and the coyote might have just found it Scavenged dead. Scavenged it, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, this might not be popular with people because I know hunters love to hate coyotes and... You know, I hate getting pictures of a coyote eating a, you know, a deer, a deer fawn, or, you know, having a coyote screw up a hunt, chases a deer off or whatever. But I, I just don't know that throwing a bounty on, unless it's a very targeted from during this month or something, Mm -hmm. I don't know that it, it would, it's going to be all that effective. I think they're going to, pay people and some people are probably going to make a lot of money on it but you know I don't know that it's going to do what they're hoping it to do before we wrap this up let's say they were to say yep we're going to do a bounty on coyotes during fawning season in order to help the the fawn survive would you guys be willing to, to take an increase on hunting license in order to fund this bounty a dollar seems pretty reasonable so you know kind of like the knee jerk thing is it's just a dollar yeah but because i i don't necessarily agree with the rule you know i would i would be i wouldn't want to pay anything because that's not really a great you know management plan right Right. and And my devil's advocate to like a dollar I mean, it's only a dollar, but I would rather them increase licenses by a dollar and put the money towards something better. Like Habitat or something. Right, right, right. And I'm not opposed to paying a dollar more for my hunting license. I'm not necessarily opposed to paying $5 more for my hunting license. As long as that money is earmarked specifically, being used specifically to better wildlife habitat. And it's, you know what I mean? Like I, I... yeah. Yeah. So it's not the dollar, it's not the, but it's, I don't know that using that increase to try and 
get rid of coyotes or decrease coyote populations, which by what researchers say isn't going to work anyhow, right. if that's really beneficial and the best use of right. that money. Yeah. So you make me, every time you say, you know, I'm not a wildlife biologist, you, do I need to preface everything? Like, by education, I am a wildlife biologist. No. Like, <laughs> I think it's no, but if you say right. something stupid, it's on you. Right. If we say something stupid, it's just because we don't know. Right. I'm, I guess I'm just saying that because I, all I'm doing is reading stuff online, uh -huh. right? I don't have any kind of background, so uh -huh. anybody can right. yeah. read these same articles, right? You've had some schooling on this, right? Well, and I'm mean, just a guy with a Google search bar, right? I mean, but really, schooling all that really is is just reading a bunch of articles, just teaching you how to use Google. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> anymore, yeah. <laughs> I don't know, anyone who's, who's been to college knows it's just how do you Google, you know, how do you do a Google search correctly for what I want to find out? Yeah. Right. And actually find reputable sources. Okay. Well, anything else, uh, any kind of closing remarks before we wrap this one up? This has been a, it's been a fun one. Right. It's been a long one. Hopefully you guys are still listening out there. Yeah. Uh, I don't got anything other Nothing? than I wish I, we'd have taken a pee break halfway through. <laughs> yeah, well, and yeah, kind of a, a closing remark thing is I think it's it's important to stay up to date on these kind of stories yeah. um, so you kind of know the state of the hunting culture, at, at least in your own state and probably your own country. Yeah. I mean, for example, the uh, the grizzly bear whole controversy grizzly bear hunting um although that doesn't affect us in ohio i directly we don't have grizzly bears here it is something interesting to stay up to date on because it, it does affect you as a hunter well and it, and it can set a precedent right, right right like this state did this thing and now everybody kind of follows suit or or they say oh this state did this thing and it didn't work and so we're not going to do that or you know right. so it's yeah and potentially, I mean, Ohio could end up getting a population of something that is, you know, deemed an endangered species at some point that is that is a game animal. Yeah. You know, and maybe we have, a, you know, it seems like a lot of these states have a real problem with grizzly bears. Now. Yeah. yeah. They're, they're overpopulated. And the money for research, or not research, but conservation that could be, you know, brought in is great. You know, they're, they're missing out on this resource of, of funds that they could be getting for conservation. So, yeah, it sets a precedent. So it is important to, to stay up to date and kind of have your voice heard, even if it doesn't really affect Ohio. Right. You know, it's, it's important to, to stay up to date and make sure that, that, your, you know, your voice is heard and that your politicians are representing your voice. Yeah. I think so. that's the important thing is we're fortunate or unfortunate, however you want to look at it, that we don't in Ohio typically have big political wildlife issues that come up. Um, Ohio's pretty status quo one year to the next there's not big drastic changes we don't have huge amounts of public land but keeping a pulse on what's going out out west and just really trying to understand how wildlife public land how that's fought over in the political arena and the good and bad of that i guess and how important your politicians really are when it comes to public land and natural resources and that kind of stuff um you know i mean it if you really dig into that stuff which that's a whole nother podcast but um there's a lot of like the whole grizzly bear thing if you talk to anyone who has any just normal human common sense it's a non it's a non-issue right there's a sustainable population that should be hunted. But because there's so much politics involved, it becomes so muddied and murky and yeah. twisted. And it's not about the grizzly bear anymore. It's about the politics of it, which is what 
you know, we want to get away from. That's not the purpose of any of it. I mean, the goal is not, the goal was to reestablish grizzly bear and to bring them back to where they, you know, their native areas or some of their native habitats. The goal was never to use a grizzly bear as a bargaining token for political. Yeah. Wildlife should be managed based on the science, not on emotion and 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 politics. It's very emotional and it, you know, that, that can very easily, like you said, set a precedent. And then that starts drifting eastward. Right. Um, you know, I mean, there's some good examples of wildlife politics out west, and there's some very, very, very bad examples yeah. of we, politicians out west who are destroying wildlife with their political yeah. agendas. We could get down this rabbit hole. Right. It's we better deep. not. Yeah. We better yeah. not. Yeah. It's deep. I think we... Yeah. We need to shut it off. Yeah. It's been a long one. Yeah. We'll get into this stuff some other time. Yeah. All right. Well, as always, I want to thank everybody for listening and and commenting and sharing our stuff. That really helps get the word out and just keep sharing, keep uh, commenting, keep interacting. We enjoy it. And uh, hopefully you get out there and find some shed antlers and hopefully you get out there and do some turkey hunting soon. So... Follow us on Facebook, we're Ohio Huntsman. Follow us on Instagram at Ohio Huntsman Podcast. And make sure you're subscribing to the show. Whatever you're using to listen to the show, whatever app, make sure you're hitting the subscribe button so that that way you're getting notified of new episodes. Post a new episode every Tuesday. And uh, just keep listening. And uh, with that, thanks everybody. Mm-hmm.